Hello, everybody, and welcome to this GPI Digital Salon titled Noble Conspiracies for a Global Community. Thank you so much to everybody who's jumped on and tagged along today. We are very excited uh, to have you today. Um, if you've not really thoroughly gone through uh, the invite that you received, you might be wondering about what conspiracies uh, that you're going to be hearing about today. I assure you these are good conspiracies. We're going to be learning from some very, very experienced people uh, in the realm of international development. We're talking about a time when we are living in the midst of a global pandemic and we're all figuring out how to, to cope. We are watching our leaders navigate countries uh, through this global crisis. Of course, uh, they can benefit from some advice from people who sat in very important seats and made very important decisions and paved the way uh, to make the world uh, a better place for all. Uh, as we speak, we're talking about a pandemic that's pushing more and more people into poverty um, as it essentially eradicates efforts that have been made to grow economies and to develop industries and sectors. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we need more working together, in fact, uh, as might come out in the conversation, an African proverb goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's what we've learned from this pandemic, that we're going to have to coordinate efforts if we're all going to emerge uh, from this pandemic um, together and well. So I am in the midst of some very incredible people, people who've accomplished astonishing things. And I don't want to do any more talking because you will be hearing from them. But I do just want to get through some housekeeping rules for the benefit of those who are joining as participants. You will notice that you are not able to unmute your mic, uh, nor are you able to activate your video. That is by design, ladies and gentlemen, we want it to stay that way. If you do want to engage the panelists at any stage, we have reserved a time towards the end of this discussion for questions and answers. If you would like to ask a question, please indicate uh, by writing in the chat box, uh, in the Q&A chat box, write your question. Uh, if you have a specific panelist that you would like to direct the question to, please indicate, and I will be sure to convey that during our Q&A time. Um, but other than that, I would not want to waste any more time. And the people who have brought us here today, um, it is the Global Perspectives Initiative. And I'd like to in in uh, invite Dr. Ingrid Ham uh, to say a few opening remarks, and then I will introduce the panelists for today. Dr. Ham, it is over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. A very warm welcome to the Utstein Four and special welcome to Vera Zongwe for our digital salon today. We are very proud that we could gather all of you, unfortunately only online and not in presence. But nevertheless, we are happy to have you here. You know, in the time of the second wave of the pandemic, we all realize that it has huge, huge consequences and special ones to Africa. Christine already mentioned that there might be 150 million people pushed back into poverty because of the lockdowns and the damages uh, the COVID-19 virus has done to the economy. Um, and what is needed now, I think are especially two aspects. One is we need strategics. We need a strategic approach to solve the problem um, and a coherent approach to do so. And we need to stand together and have a European answer to that much more than a German national one. So uh, today the Utstein Four lift what I said right now. They were about strategic development and they were about uh, cooperation and collaboration. So they are the best model we could find for how Europe could proceed into the future. And Vera Sangwe is, uh, 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 is not only a voice from Africa, she is a very experienced UN person and she knows about econo economics best. So uh, we have five women. I'm very proud to say though. Uh, and we have um, best representatives of, of what is needed now. And of course we have one 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 man in our round uh, who brought uh, who brought the let's say um, the reason upon why we meet already today because as 
had already been mentioned, the book has been pu uh, published recently, and that's about strategic development, and uh, Costas wrote it, so he's the author, and please, Christine, just go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hum. So just for those, for the benefit of those who might not be familiar with the uh, quartet, we're talking about, I want to take you back. It is a Thursday and on social media, we tend to throw back uh, on a Thursday. So I'll take you to about 20 years ago, uh, where four women found themselves uh, holding the posts of international development ministers in their respective countries. Those countries were Norway, the United Kingdom, Germany, and the Netherlands. And they identified poverty as a major issue, a global issue at that time, and they decided that they would come together and tackle that. And so they did very much in terms of that direction. We saw some of their policies, uh, which they will talk about. They, talk, they looked at debt relief, for example, and various other things, uh, inter including mobilizing development policy and taking it in a direction that did more than just pursue the self-interest uh, of their respective countries. They're going to talk about some of the ex successes that they experienced uh, in all of that. Before they do that, of course, the dashing dude in our midst, um, I like to say maybe we have a, a bit of a, a scenario of the golden girls and the dashing dude. Costas, you've penned this incredible book, um, and I don't want to just reduce you to a pretty face, Costas, because you are a whole lot more than that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Costas, who has written this book titled Ending Global Poverty, Four Women's Noble Conspiracy, and that is the conspiracy that we're discussing today, Ending Global Poverty. Uh, we are talking about a very senior uh, and experienced economist who's spent time at the World Bank, uh, among other institutions. I don't want to go too into your bio for too long, let's get into what's in the book, Costa. So take us through uh, what is in this book, uh, which is really the quest of what these four incredible women sought to do before we get into conversation with them. Costa, it's over to you. Uh, Christine, uh, thank you very much. Uh... I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ham and the uh, Global uh, Perspectives Initiative for, in, uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, great uh, meeting. Uh, I must say that uh, I'm extremely happy that uh, I am able to join this panel of this absolutely remarkable four women, but which I wrote a book recently. Uh, I must, uh, in order to get going, I'll decide to say a few words about what prompted me to write this book. Uh, the international community knew for a long time uh, what uh, really was needed uh, to develop uh, developing countries. Uh, way back, the Grant Commission uh, was instrumental in laying a lot of these issues uh, for everybody to understand. But the difference was that these four women actually made it happen. And that was the critical element uh, which made me focus on their work uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, the Ulstein ministers were and are strong leaders. Uh, they are persuasive, they are articulate, they are substantive, they are politically savvy, and they are together, and they were together. And I'm very pleased that they were all with us uh, this uh, afternoon. Um, they uh, organized themselves in what they called the, the conspiracy of implementation. Uh, and they were able to convince a lot of their colleagues to go along with their conspiracy so that they could actually produce results. And they produced results in, uh, in several areas which are of relevance today. Uh, they helped uh, put together uh, an international agenda which increased uh, the volume of resources that moved to the developing countries. They also helped uh, uh, reduce the debt of the developing countries, and not only helped in the debt reduction uh, um, of the developing countries, poor developing countries in particular in Africa, but also pushed for making sure that the resources released in that fashion were actually devoted to helping end poverty. And that was very critical because up to that time, that was not an emphasis in the international community. And finally, they uh, put together an, uh, an agenda to increase the aid effectiveness. And uh, this is very important because uh, aid effectiveness is not an easy thing to deal with. And uh, there are lots of, there's lots of controversy over time. 
But uh, they stress the three main issues. One is that the partner countries had to be in the driver's seat. They also had to have uh, decent policies and programs which were coherent in addressing uh, overall poverty objectives. And third, they expected the developed countries, the donors, to shift their attention away from little projects all over the place and also to, uh, to start supporting the efforts of the developing countries by providing them budget support. This was very critical because it moved the discussion away from what the donors uh, were doing, but also to making sure that the developing countries themselves were the ones that uh, took the charge of their own destiny. At the end of the day, developing countries developed themselves, not the donors. Uh, all of which resulted in a lot of uh, progress, especially in the first decade of, uh, of this century. I want to say a few words about the relevance of all of this to the challenges that the international community faces today. Uh, we are facing a global pandemic, and the global pandemic requires global multilateral action. And for this, uh, I think it is very important to go back and take a look at the situation uh, 20 years ago, when they were active internationally. Multilateral debt relief for poor countries is as important today as it was then, especially in Africa. Resources have to be found to raise the amount of aid that goes to developing countries, rather than to reduce it, as some of the budgets I'm, I'm looking at in, in Europe are now calling for today. We need to uh, focus on this very, uh, an issue which has not been very uh, much in prominent in recent periods. And third, I think again, aid effectiveness uh, is important. We have to make sure that the resources that are now moving or would be moving to developing countries are used effectively. Um, leaders of today and tomorrow, all of us will benefit from looking at the experience of the Utstein Four. Uh, we all will get inspired, uh, or should be get inspired, for a new uh, conspiracy of implementation, a new conspiracy of implementation that addresses the problems of today and supports developing countries in their efforts to eliminate poverty on a sustainable basis. Thank you very much for helping me with the book. Thank you so much for that, Kostas. Um, I did say uh, when I was introducing the book that we're almost throwing back, but a lot of the issues that you've touched on uh, that the huge time for we're dealing with 20 years ago, we're still confronted with today. So that makes this conversation even more relevant. Uh, at this time, I just want to bring into our conversation Vera Songwe, uh, who is, of course, uh, the Executive Secretary for the African Commission at the United Kingdom. Uh, Vera, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. You're well placed, Vera, to, to have this conversation with us, to, to launch us off um, as to what the continent is experiencing right now and some of the issues that you are championing, some of the solutions that you're proposing. Um, before you get into that, I just know from a, from a reporting perspective, we were all waiting for the onslaught uh, in Africa. We were all anticipating that this continent would be affected. In many conversations that I had, in interviews, all these analysts were, were, were predicting doom and gloom in terms of what COVID would do from a health perspective on the continent. Uh, we're all sitting here today scratching our heads wondering why we were all wrong. Um, but it has done something, Vera. COVID has had a massive impact uh, on the economy uh, in Africa. Please talk us through that uh, and perhaps touch on the health aspect as well, but talk us through the impact on, on, on the African economy, um, as well as some of the things that you're championing and recommending to address that. Um, first of all, uh, Christine, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our listeners. I feel a little bit like I'm being uh, in the middle of you know, my uh, mentees and I should go and ask each one of them for advice. So uh, let me say what an honor it is to be here among such greats. Uh, uh, um, discussing this, and thank you for uh, to Dr. Ham for uh, bringing us together. Um, 
Listen, I think three things uh, before we, we, we go into it. And, and uh, you know, he just talked about it at the end there on the sort of conspiracy of implementation. I think that's a little bit the secret, right? Um, Africa has been, we were all, as you said, expecting doom and gloom and, you know, things were going to be worse. But I think one of the things that we saw was African finance ministers get together uh, very quickly, very early on in this crisis. And I think that this is uh, just to, because I think uh, you have said it and uh, he, he's also said, you know, we're 20 years back. I don't think we're 20 years back. And I think it should be really clear. We're not 20 years back. We have actually, the continent has moved 20 years forward. And, and so the, the, the sort of impression that we're back to where we were 20 years ago, let's take that out of the table. I think that what happened this time around is very early on in March, March 19th actually, African finance ministers met and said, something is happening to us. What do we need to do? And, and we were privileged as the Economic Commission for Africa to sort of you know, be able to do the analytical work that was able to foreshadow you know, what were the problems, where we were beginning to hurt, uh, in March, everybody was saying, well, it will hit Africa in six months. We were all talking about the health pandemic at the time, but the economic uh, crisis had already hit. And it was not in the global media because nobody was talking about it. But when the ministers of finance met, that message came out. You know, they all started saying, we're seeing our revenues dry up, we're seeing this. And when we did the analysis, at that point, there was already a 2% uh, uh, drop in, in GDP. Today, we are at negative 5.8% growth for the continent. So we have experienced an almost 5% drop in our GDP on average. Um, immediately after that, the African finance ministers then said, this is the solution that we propose. And so they sent letters out to the IMF and the World Bank and, and, and the Clears and, and Ingrid's and uh, Christine's of the world in their respective and Heine Marie and said, you know, this is what's happening in Africa and this is the kind of uh, solution that we want. So I think that's the first difference was that Africa was able to say, this is what we're feeling, this is when we're feeling it, this is how we're feeling it, and this is the solution that we're asking for. And, and, and my sense is that it's a, a very important difference from the past. Now the question is, and I think uh, um, to, the, to the ministers, and I think this is the experience, the conspiracy of implementation is, yes, there was the ask. Uh, but, you know, in some sense, you almost need a conspiracy of implementation on two sides. And so you had the conspiracy of implementation on the African side, but I don't know that we necessarily had uh, the obstinate four uh, uh, in you. I, and you know, you 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 should come back so that maybe we have you on the other side, and then we have a, a level high playing field on both sides. So I think that that's what's happened. Is is there has been an ask, an ask for a hundred billion dollars uh, to the most retro development agencies to help stand up the GDP that has been lost from the continent. The African finance ministers also asked for a debt service suspension initiative, and that again is a difference. They didn't ask for debt forgiveness, which was what 20 years ago we were asking for. African finance ministers said, we don't know the magnitude of this crisis. We need liquidity. And I think this is the other difference is while African ministers are talking about liquidity, the rest of the world is talking about debt crisis. But what we need, first of all, is liquidity to ensure that we can actually find our way out of the crisis, because many of the African economies got into this crisis with good macro fundamentals. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, when you listen to the conversation on Africa, it's as if we are 20 years ago where 70% of our economies were about to crash and need a hippie. And that's not the case. And that's why I insist on making sure that we don't make the, the, the equivalence with, with uh, 20 years ago. Uh, the third thing is Africa now has a much larger private sector. And Africa's private sector is the one that is going to bring back growth. It's going to have to bring it back differently. It's going to have to be greener, cleaner, uh, to ensure that it survives. And finally, we have today in Africa, what is a growth blueprint, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which is essentially trying to grow the African internal market before we get out. And for that, we also need some support. And that's why, as the Economic Commission for Africa, we are saying, for the African countries that have access to markets and that are going to need to stand up their infrastructure, their digital economies, and ensure that they can actually begin to trade more, we need them to have access to markets, but they, have, they need access to markets at much, much cheaper rates. For a very long time, what you have essentially seen is a transfer of wealth from Africa to the private sector, to the markets, because our interest rates have been quite high. And I usually give an example of the comparison between Germany and South Africa where the debt to GDP ratios in Germany are the same like those in South Africa, except the cost of money for Germany 
is 28 basis points or 25 basis points, and sometimes it's even negative, which means the Germans are begging us to borrow, you know, to give us money. Whereas in South Africa, it's 900 basis points. So just even if they run their economies the same, because of the cost of money, South Africa will go under. And we need, we cannot continue this kind of transfer, uh, uh, what I call essentially regressive tax. And we need to be able to adjust the cost of money for Africa to something that is cost reflective of the real risk return uh, uh, in that environment. So that's the third thing we're asking for. So three things, additional capital for concessional money to the multilateral development banks, extension of the debt service suspension initiative, so it provides a little bit more liquidity, and working to reduce interest rates for countries that have access to markets so they can actually undertake long and sustainable investments, hopefully in, uh, in sustainable areas like energy. Vera, thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that the, the three things are very clear. Claire, I want to bring you into the conversation here because I want you to, to speak to everything, the three things that, that Vera has specifically uh, talked about. And perhaps before you do that, um, just a throwback question before you get to, to, to the question I've asked is, how were you able to be successful in, in what you guys did coming together? If you could name one of your successes, Tell us about how you, 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 you made that happen, because I think that speaks to what the finance ministers on the continent today are trying to do. Well, the crucial thing we did was say lots and lots of tiny little initiatives with a kind of charitable lens in development don't help countries. They recruit people out of the government systems and it, the burden of accountability just holds countries back. So we need to all unite behind agendas led by the, the countries, because it's when countries want reform and change, that's when it succeeds, and come together, you know, get the, get the World Bank, all the big donors, the regional development banks, the UN system, all coming behind those countries' efforts to really push forward on agreed objectives. And that was around poverty reduction, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, I mean, and now we've got the Sustainable Development Goals. We've got the immediate crisis, and that's got to be dealt with, but also we've got the enormous threat of climate change, which is going to displace so many people and throw people out of their employment and so on. And we need the same kind of massive international cooperation behind the efforts of local governments to get through this crisis, which will otherwise hurt all of us all over the world. If there's one thing we've learned from COVID is no country safe unless all countries are um, making progress. And as you say, We've seen this remarkable leadership in Africa. Let's, everyone said, oh, it's going to be terrible. But the handling of the crisis with the public health response, partly because the continent learned to deal with Ebola, shows that Africa isn't a sort of hopeless case that doesn't know what it's doing. There are more and more effective people, and they need to be backed so that the economic crisis that follows on from COVID is dealt with and then the continuing social and economic development that makes people's lives better and will enable them to deal with the crisis of climate change is also there. Evelyn, I want to bring you uh, into the conversation here because it, it, there is a call to Europe uh, in, in the sense that the development policy coming from the continent needs to be different. Um, and I, I heard the sort of subtlety coming uh, in, in, in various address. So given what Vera has said, given what the continent said, this is what we're asking for. How does Europe adapt in terms of when it sets up its development policy in response? Well, I think the European answer has been response has actually been very weak or there has been no response to the African crisis, I think. Uh, what Europe should be doing, first and foremost, countries like Germany and, ne and the Netherlands really have to rack up their debt, rack up their public spending, because otherwise we just abort any of the recovery internationally that is going on. And part of that, racking up of debt and expenditure, should be spent on transfer to poor countries. Um, what Europe also should be doing is open more markets. Vera was talking about those countries that already have, have open markets, well, actually, there is a huge room to improve for Europe to open its markets for products made by poor producers in poor African countries, and very little has been done about it. So there's a whole issue on trade, where 
Europe actually has been putting its back to the rest of the world. I mean, things like export controls on essential medical equipment. I mean, I really found that such a total lack of solidarity. If you look at the trade agreements of uh, Europe, they have a sustainable development chapter. Well, you know what's in there? Labor rights, climate change, environment, all very important. But there's no, ever, no text whatsoever looking at the impact of trade agreements on actually the poor countries. So I think there's a huge room for Europe to improve its response. I hope that was the answer to the question because I really didn't understand it totally. That, that was, Heidi, do you want to weigh in at this time? Sorry? Do you want to weigh in? I, I, I was well, gesturing. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, uh, because I think the European answer is is important, and uh, actually, normally there would have been a conference between the African Union and the European Union, which unfortunately will not take place. But anyway, I think we should be nowadays in a situation where there is a new type of alliance between uh, African and European countries, because there are even if, of course, their economic situation is completely different, there are joint interests to a certain extent specifically related to the climate situation. I mean, we are partners in this field, and it's, it's Europe and Africa, they are the neighboring continents. Compared to that, I must say, um, I'm, I'm rather critical on the fact that, for instance, the European Union so far in its uh, plans for the reconstruction fund is centering very much on the own situation, which of course uh, I understand because there are countries like Spain and, and Italy um, which need support. But on the other hand, uh, in the whole negotiation process, there has been so far, if the European Parliament does not change uh, this, there has been actually a cut in the finance for the international cooperation uh, for the next seven years, which is the, well, the seven years uh, program now. And I think this makes the European Union, let's say, uh, less apt to, to be a global player and, and to be in, the, in this field. So uh, I think if nowadays, uh, well, we, we would be needed, our advice would be needed, it would be to say, let's, use these possibilities of cooperation in order to get uh, reconstruction support and financial support, uh, Vera, which, which you've outlined on one hand, and also debt relief. I, I personally would have thought debt relief would be more important because it leaves some more space, but I mean, that is up to, to your discussion, of course, and also support in the cooperation in the field of climate change because um, I mean what one look if one looks at the situation now you can see that if the African Union or Africa wants to uh, uh, change decarbonize wants to change its uh, energy sector of course but huge investment and support in this field is needed because if not you are sitting on well stranded assets and this is what cannot be accepted so uh, i i'm all for uh, being supportive in this field and also make sure it's not words but make deeds from words and that's what we try to do with the, the, in our cooperation and that's what we need nowadays yeah, I mean, just to your point about the energy sector, I know Vera, you said that Africa is really the, the only continent where you can still invest in new energy, um, because as you put it, the continent is still dark, which presents uh, an opportunity of sort. But Vera, one thing we, we can't get away from, we can't run away from the fact that a lot of countries on the continent are going to have to go and borrow uh, to get out of this crisis. What do you anticipate on that front? No, so, so thank you. I think, of course, a lot of countries are going to borrow. And I always like to say that borrowing is not a bad thing. It's, it's how, it's, it's at what cost you borrow and what you use the borrowing for. That's where the problems begin. If it's too expensive borrowing and if you use it for something not so good and the governance around it is terrible, then please don't borrow. 
Otherwise, you know, you always need additional capital to grow. I think what we need is, and, and, and again, for Africa, we need to segment the markets, right? There's over 50 countries at very different ranges of economies. Uh, um, as Evelyn said, and, and, and you know, one of the things that we're certainly going to need is for some of the really low income countries, and thank God for, the, for Kristalina, the IMF, another woman, yeah. of course. And I was just looking at you guys and thinking you came too early. You should have been here now when Kristalina was at the IMF, and then maybe we would have had uh, 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 an earthquake. No, in, uh, in we, we, we cooperated with Kristalina uh, uh, when she was in the World Bank. In the World Bank, exactly. And then in the European Union. Exactly. So exactly. it has been an ongoing uh, cooperation, yes. fortunately. Sorry. But, but that, I think that did just demonstrates the power of the woman. So let's not lose that because I think there is a difference and it continues to show up. Uh, and my sense is for the low income countries, and the reason I brought Kristalina in was immediately after the African finance ministers met, she immediately provided debt relief for the 19 uh, low income countries of the continent. So not just debt service relief, yeah. which means not just payments, but the whole debt was written up, everything that was owed to the IMF. That immediately provided liquidity. There's a second group of countries for which the G20 then provided the debt service suspension initiative where we are asking that that be extended through uh, uh, next year. And then finally, there's the sort of market accessing countries. And that for me is a little bit of where the pain is because you know the book is talking about poverty reduction. We just did a, a report which is gonna come out on poverty and inequality. We've done, Africa as a continent has done an amazing job of reducing poverty. And when you look at countries like Egypt, 3% of the population is poor, but 40% of the population is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So when you have a crisis like the COVID crisis, that 40% immediately falls into poverty. But the international response doesn't look at Egypt and say Egypt is vulnerable and Egypt needs help. The international response says Egypt is a middle income country. <laughs> Egypt can deal with, manage its own, its own uh, finances. So I think this is where we need to segment the financing and we need to look at the way we're supporting countries differently in this crisis because it has totally upended what countries are and what they need. Mm. Hilda, I there's just been you know, a World Bank report making exactly the point exactly, that you made, Vera. That the risk of a lot of people falling into poverty is actually in the middle income countries. Exactly. People that have improved their life and the danger is that they all drop down and go backwards. And it's also where the, the uh, many of, of people are indeed uh, threatened by COVID, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, Vera, you said the power of the women as you spoke. Um, but as I was reading, uh, ladies, and, and this is something you've said before from the quartet, that poverty has a face, and that face is a woman's face. So that is also the, the, the reality. And I guess we, we have to deal with the, the sort of humanitarian aspect as well. So Hilda, you labored the point about humanitarianism when we had our pre-conversation and I wondered how, how we do both things, how we, we, we focus on humanitarian efforts but that we also develop policies that allow countries to grow because somebody says humanitarian efforts and everybody thinks donor aid and that's not what it is. is it? Well, the humanitarian operations, of course, is, is um, aid that is targeting crises in countries, right? So we need to do both. Where there is a significant crisis happening, whether it's a natural disaster or it's conflict, um, we need to be able to provide people the aid uh, they, uh, they depend on to survive, frankly. And that's different from the developing, uh, the develop, develop work that we uh, have been engaged with for, for many years in trying to enable countries to take charge of their own destiny. Now, conflict affected countries are in a very difficult situation and they're fragile states and the number of them, unfortunately, have increased uh, steadily. Uh, that has uh, put countries in a very, very difficult uh, situation. And many of these are protracted crises. And here, um, one of the things that I think uh, the Youth Stand Group uh, would have advocated if we were in office now, is uh, a new uh, way of giving humanitarian assistance, which is to give people cash in hand. Instead of this huge industry providing food and everything people need, uh, they are able to get some cash to be able to start cultivating create local markets, get the economy going again. This is a new way of doing humanitarian operations that 
is very much in line with our thinking. Empower people, put, put the resources into their hands. Of course, in some cases, when conflict is, is really destroying communities, you can't cultivate, you run for your life. But in many natural disaster settings and in some of these protracted crises, this is a very good way of giving people the opportunity to survive and help um, actually build a future for themselves. So that's uh, a way of, uh, of using aid, which is different from the traditional humanitarian operations. Now, um, what we uh, have engaged in, uh, and I think uh, one of the maybe uh, important kind of achievements that I just wanted to mention is uh, debt relief has been discussed here uh, in terms of uh, what, what was achieved. I just wanted to, to bring out one example of um, one way of boldly um, addressing uh, an issue and winning that fight. So when we, uh, together with our colleagues and good allies, advocated very strongly for writing off the debt, with the heavily indebted poor countries initiative, we were running against a funding gap. That funding gap uh, was, was significant. Uh, we needed the money. Uh, there wasn't enough aid. And the question was, where do we get that money from? Important forces wanted us to take that money from the poor, meaning that other poor countries would pay uh, the debt relief for uh, their colleagues. They wanted us to borrow from AIDA, which is the World Bank's concessional window. We fought very hard for protecting AIDA, for not having Peter to pay for Paul. Um, and what happened was we advocated for the sale of IMF gold. This actually, through a huge battle, was successful. But if somebody just a few years before had asked me, would the IMF gold, a significant amount of it, be sold for debt relief for poor countries, I would have laughed. It was seen as unheard of. Just a few years back, of course, we had good allies. It was possible to mobilize uh, that, uh, that majority in the board for making that happen. But I wanted to mention this because the world is running against significant crises, huge challenges, and sometimes it's about bringing people together, aligning all of them behind bold proposals. And if you are strategic, tactical, and conspire mm. properly, <laughs> you can actually win the game. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that yeah. as one example, yeah. because yeah. now yeah. the world is facing other challenges, yeah. COVID-19 among them. So, that, as an example, I just wanted to share. Yeah. So Evelyn, you want to say something? And then we'll come to you, Heidi Marie. Yeah. Yes, I, I just want to say that this is one of the examples of things that have been advocated for half a century. You know, the bounty report, et cetera, et cetera. It's one example of we did not invent the wheel because, you know, everything was known what should be done. We made a turn. Us working together made it happen. And I think that was unique of the last, of these years that we worked together. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to come in on this specific point because, uh, I mean, uh, our cooperation, for instance, in World Bank was important. Um, and if you take, for instance, at least when I came into the, the meetings in, in 1998 or 1999, until then, evidently uh, rather more male uh, participants read out from well the, the USA uh, or European Union read out as speaking notes got up and left the room leaving it to someone else and we made them we we made we pressed them to argue they had to argue they had to listen and i think this is important and specifically in the situation as nowadays, it is important that the World Bank plays such an important role. And also, um, uh, for instance, related to the European uh, Union, when we had a situation, it's an, a completely different uh, element, but nevertheless, uh, when we had a situation where, for instance, um, the USA cut UNFPA finance 
which which hit specifically women and their sexual and reproductive rights the, we cooperated in the european union to stand in for the lack uh, lacking finance in this field so i think that is the way uh, i think one has to go into meetings one has to take others along and then you get enough supporters and you you get enough uh, alliance uh, members if uh, you want yes. to say so if i if i could add there's some we're living in rather pessimistic times when a lot of yeah. people feel very kind of depressed about what's going on in the world and i think one of the things that we experience if you get together and start to push and get some success it kind of builds its own momentum and people become yeah. hopeful and make more demands we need that very much now when everything's feeling depressive and hopeless that some brave voices coming together strongly um as you say vera behind uh some some of the good initiatives that have been taken um at the international level i think could shift the mood and 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 that would create enthusiasm and more cooperation and then Politics has that fashionableness that people want to be on the side of the angels if what seem to be angels. Yeah. We need that kind of shift, and I think it could be could be one. Can I jump in with an example here, Christine? Yes. Yes. Just uh, one opportunity to do exactly what Claire said is vaccines um, for the poorest countries. When the vaccines have been tested, if the world succeeds in bringing scaling up the delivery of vaccines to the poorest first to make sure that they and the vulnerable people, of course, in all other countries are given the opportunity to be protected against the virus. If that's kind of where the, the spirit of cooperation, collaboration, solidarity can really be brought to bear, that can, be, that can help turn the tide. And people yeah. can see there's, there's really something in it for all of us. So if we help protect others we are ourselves protected uh, the virus won't come back and mutate and, and and attack us again and it is when we are acknowledging that we are in this world together we have to solve this problem together i think that can turn the tide also in other areas so in for me that's kind of the first test now that that is done and that world leaders put their you know heads to, to, together and just make it happen mobilize the resources necessary work together it can actually be a renaissance for multilateralism that leads that's my hope right thank you so much for that and you did talk about the uh, the vaccine and i will take the opportunity because i am in the midst of politicians to throw a jab in there uh somebody said on twitter <laughs> the vaccine excuse the pun uh that when the vaccine is is is, is, is discovered that it should be tested on politicians first Mm -hmm. uh, and that if they survive, then we know that the vaccine is safe. If they don't survive, then we know that the world is safe. Uh, so not mine, that's one I found on Twitter. Uh, but I do want to come back to you, Haida Marie, and, and to the conversation about, you know, this is, when Vera spoke, um, she alerted us to the fact that we saw initiative coming through from the continent. Uh, we're looking at a time where we want to generate wealth on the continent. We want to generate resources. And taxation is one of the ways that governments do that. What kind of partnerships um, can there be between, between Europe and Africa in terms of assisting the continent, governments on the continent, be able to, to maximize on tax collections? Well, uh, this is a point I'm, I'm working at uh, in, in a panel with, of the United Nations for the time uh, being on, well, on proposals which already have been discussed and brought forward specifically in Africa by the Mbeki uh, Commission on the question how to see to it that there is not a drain of resources and finance from Africa uh, outside, whereas it would be needed in the respective countries in, uh, for the financing of the fight against poverty, uh, fight against climate change, and also fulfilling the, the SDGs. Uh, now, some points that uh, we are discussing and hopefully also bringing forward is on one hand is the question of indeed a digitalized, uh, the digital taxation, the taxation uh, and also uh, what we call the beneficial ownership to see that who is the natural owner of uh, in order to prevent 
uh, tax evasion going on so that you know who should be uh, taxed. So that, that, and also, of course, help those countries which are interested in cre creating uh, taxation systems which are stable and uh, show solidarity among uh, people. I think this would be a, a, po a point of uh, importance and also the so-called country by country reporting that you are, uh, which is, should be public, which shows which, in which country, which, um, uh, well, uh, uh, firm or capital institution is paying which taxation so that there is a transparency uh, in this field and uh, people can hold them and, and those people uh, responsible for what they are doing. So I think those are some points where proposals came from African country within their proposals and now we should try to see to get it um, in the OECD and also, of course, in the United Nations. There is an initiative also in the OECD, based on yes. profit shifting. Of you know, course. companies move the money, yeah. I mean, in the case of Europe, to Luxembourg because there's a low tax yeah. rate and then everyone has to bring their taxes down and then yeah. countries can't fund. And I mean, it's, this has been affecting Africa for decades, yeah. but it's yeah. spreading across the world and it needs to be stopped and reversed. Yeah. So it's another case where we, if, if we start to move forward, most countries have got an interest in improving this rather than, you know, the big giants, the Amazons and Googles are not paying much tax at all, although they're making big profits in all our countries. And so, uh, of course, one of the debates is whether it should only be OECD or whether it should not also be, well, other uh, um, countries, developing countries, to have a say in the norms that are dealt with? I, I do believe that they, there is a working party that includes yeah, 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 yeah. developing countries, not just OECD. Yeah, but, well, uh, I think this is a point which I think will develop further to show that there is a possibility to have a greater participation in, in the UN framework. Right. Vera, I want to bring you in here. I mean, I have a Sorry. question for you uh, regarding the private sector, um, but you could also start off um, by answering to this question, the profit shifting and, and the, uh, you know, creating, uh, generating uh, more resource by way of tax collection. Um, but my question really would be to you about the private sector. You've spoken about how uh, we need to, to get the private sector on board um, in terms of helping the recovery um, from the pandemic. Of course, we will know in the African context, that's where the jobs are being created. We rely on that sector for job creation. No, yes, please. I think, as we know, actually, across the world, 70% um, of the jobs are created in uh, small and medium enterprises. And so it is crucial that uh, uh, they have continuous financing, that they have existing working capital to, 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 to continue working. What we have seen in the West, of course, is, you know, stimulus packages that have gone to either keep uh, people employed, even if they were not producing, or provide uh, salary uh, uh, support to many of the businesses. That has not been the case in many of the African countries. African countries, I must say, provided about $46 billion of their own resources in relief to their private sectors, either by way of uh, saying, you know, no tax uh, payments should happen for three, three months. So there's been some relief, but not enough at all. And I want my answer to sort of, one of the things that we have done at the Economic Commission for Africa is, you know, we talked about this vulnerable population that is the African private sector in, in large numbers, right? They are in this sort of vulnerable informal sector where they're doing well when times are good and when times are bad, they fall below the poverty line, but they also disappear because we don't know where they are. And so we need to then stand up a whole digital economy that allows them for, for work to happen. We've just done a report that shows that those who have survived better, the private sector that has survived better during this crisis is a private sector that is connected is a private sector that has access to the internet. But we know that on the continent, only 17.8% of the population actually does have access to the internet that works that they can afford. So it's a very, very small number. So coming out of this crisis, not only is the digital uh, sector going to provide more jobs, but it is a sector that's clearly going to create more sustainability as we go forward, can absorb the, the, the youth that we have. I just wanna go back very quickly to the 
a question on illicit financial flows. And I think one of the things that the Obstin 4 did was the institutionalization of a lot of the things that you did. You, you sort of, you did, did just do them and move on. You made sure that they were institutionalized. And I think one of the things that happened in 2008, 2009, when there was a whole conversation around tax havens because of the financial crisis yeah. in the G20 world, there was a lot that was done to strengthen institutions in the G20. At the time in Africa, we were saying that tax havens are star havens, star being the stolen assets recovery uh, uh, program that the World Bank launched at the time. But we never got the kind of pickup yeah. that the yeah. G20 got in terms of you know, uh, the tax havens part. So the tax havens part got picked up, but the stolen assets recovery part, the star part didn't get picked up. And so I think we do need to work to institutionalize some of these exactly. gaps when we see them quickly. Yeah. Mm. And, and I think in this crisis, that's one of the things we need to try to do. The big area for institutionalization is digital transformation. Mm. How can we you know, m make sure that we put in place, now there is a rush linked to revenue to sort of say, let's tax all digital tra uh, transactions. But the digital transactions are happening in the rural areas. So then we sort of hit a regressive tax and we do need to take care that when we do that, we do it in a way that doesn't actually shy the poorer people away from something that should be benefiting them. So I think working around the institutionalization of the processes in a way that works well is something you did very well. And we hope that we can bring the right stakeholders around the table to balance that approach this time around, if we get there. Absolutely. Hilda, can you come into the conversation here? Um, because I think, you know, I'm hearing the theme, we, we need a lot of multilateralism right now. But what we saw uh, with the pandemic was countries closing in. Uh, we saw even here in Europe, uh, countries closing in, shutting their yeah. doors to each other, hoarding uh, things like resources, uh, medical supplies, etc. Um, big players in the world, Washington, for example, we have an administration there where multilateralism is not necessarily, you know, the, the sort of cup of tea of the day. Um, what do we do in this regard? Uh, if anything, this pandemic has shown us, especially the partnership between these two neighboring continents, what do we do? How do we reset this engagement? Um, and promote multilateralism at a time such as this? There are initiatives ongoing, uh, in particular in the area I mentioned earlier, the vaccine area, um, mm -hmm. which has uh, support from a very, very vast number of countries. Unfortunately, three important countries have so far not signed up to it, um, but hopefully they can be convinced, um, including uh, the, the Washington. Um, what is critical with that initiative is, is that uh, they will provide poor countries, um, hopefully with free vaccines, so that there is a, a real, um, a real uh, solidarity hand uh, coming. Uh, so that response, there, there are initiatives underway. However, I think in terms of uh, the economic impact, um, the huge uh, funds that have been made available, both in the IMF and the World Bank, uh, have been really significant. Um, this has been uh, a global decision. It was discussed in the G20. It was passed in the board where majority shareholders are donors still, unfortunately. Um, we fought also to increase the African representation in those institutions. Oh, yeah. um, and so uh, yeah. there, there has been significant funds coming. However, um, they have been uh, just buffering the kind of onslaught impact. What is coming now, of course, is uh, much, much bigger challenges in terms of uh, getting the economies going and ensuring uh, that uh, that impact is, is cushioned. Here, what I'm really worried about now is cuts in aid um, and also FDI. Uh, of course, when the economy, as Vera was saying, when the economy suffers um, in a global sense, of course, FDI shrinks, I mean, foreign direct investment. And you will see less um, foreign capital coming in to help give the jobs that people need to get the economy going. That's the biggest worry that I see at, at the moment, where we are likely to see uh, a number of OECD countries, I hope it doesn't happen, but we we, I'm afraid it happens, that aid is cut and that FDI is held back. How we can address that um, is, I think, um, maybe to use the opportunity of the EU and the AU, I mean the EU, the African continent and the Europeans, 
to be maybe the first place to start. Um, how can we start a dialogue about handling this situation? I'm, I agree with Heidemarie, it's unfortunate that the meeting that was supposed to take place just a, a week back, I think, or two weeks, had to be cancelled. I think now is the time to really link up, uh, if not uh, in, in person, at least physically, to discuss what is it that uh, Europe can do in relation to Africa, and what can finance ministers in Europe do with finance ministers in Africa. And maybe we can, I'm just thinking out loud here, maybe we can revitalize the big table. <laughs> this uh, with Vera now yeah. at the Economic Commission for Africa, okay. we did discuss and established with KY Amaoko at the mm -hmm. time, your, yeah. your predecessor, how we could work together as development ministers and finance ministers. In this case, you know, the big table needs to be expanded with both, you know, finance ministers on the OECD side plus uh, and other uh, relevant ministers that are working on industry and, and see whether there's an opportunity here for a conversation about is there more that we can do now to really change uh, things in a positive direction and maybe get rid of some of the blockages that we have tried to get rid of for a long time and use the opportunity for a positive change for once and then see whether more investment can happen. I mean, it's a difficult time for the economy in, in many European countries, many OECD countries, but still worth to see whether policy changes could take place, whether some of these important blockages could be addressed and whether more uh, collaboration could happen on FDI, on aid, uh, on multilateral. This is a really yeah. important time with, with the African Union getting the continent to get rid of the barriers inside the continent so mm. yeah. trade more with itself and then mm -hmm. Africa will process its own goods instead of exporting raw material. Yeah. I mean, it's a real opportunity and it's an African initiative and that could really lift the economy. We need to get behind that and do everything that can be done to support the continent making a big success of this initiative. I don't know if you want to say a word on it, Vera. It is important, no? No, no. I mean, I, I fully agree with you. I think one of the things that has happened during this crisis, and Christine referred to it at the beginning, was, you know, when the crisis began, Africa imports about 90% of its uh, pharmaceutical products from outside the continent. There were threats, about 52% from Europe. Europe said no more, uh, uh, India, China said no more, and we found ourselves with, with, without any uh, commodities on the health side. Immediately, the private sector in Africa got together, we stood up a platform, and we said, fine, we will produce our own. And, you know, three, four months later, we have German companies coming and saying, we want to come and do with you. We have mm. British companies, we have American companies. Okay. And I think that's another difference, which is that uh, in, in South Africa, for example, you know, the Volkswagen uh, uh, business, they, you know, started producing ventilators in Morocco. The, the, you know, so there was Africans repurposing to produce for Africa. At the end of the day, we have a 1.3 billion market. And so yeah. I think we do need that sitting on the table at some point, almost as equals, right? And, and I think the minute we did that, and just to give you a sense, we were being told on the continent, you will only get PP PPEs and test kits in December. We stood up this platform and we had more test kits than we could want because everybody wanted to sell on our platform. And, and so I think that, that this is part of, of what is happening now on the continent inside the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement was mm -hmm. to say, you know, Let's get African producers, let's get the African private sector, take the charge, take the challenge, uh, working with a lot of DFIs, the CDC, the KFW and others that were providing some concessional working capital. But it actually did change the, 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 the sort of dynamics because, you know, you had private African businesses at the table as well mm. doing foreign direct investment because they were, you know, Ugandan who had, and I want to come back to a very important point that was made in the beginning, the countries that fought and won Ebola are the ones that are doing quite well in this crisis, mm -hmm. which is one of the yeah. reasons North Africa doesn't seem to yeah. be able to sort of fight the battle. North Africa has been in a consistent lockdown because they had not had the kinds of Ebola and pneumonia and cholera yeah. crisis. Yeah. So they just didn't have the local healthcare workers that Liberia, Sierra Leone, Uganda had to be able to fight the crisis. And I think that's a lesson that we have learned and we have those institutions of the continent and the issue today is just how you stand them. Now from learning about the PPEs, we decided as Africa, we will also begin to take charge of the vaccine conversation. 
Right, right. Hi, Marie. You want to go yeah. in there? No, I, I just, uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to say, I think since the, the outlook sometimes is in the negative, I think it shows very much that compared to situations 20 years ago, the interaction, the cooperation today is in a new type of multilateralism, but it has grown and the possibilities to interact are much better. If you remember the way we had to contact without email nearly at that time, mm. nowadays you have NGOs, you have uh, also progressive countries, you have a complete different African Union and, and uh, these initiatives. So I think there is a, a new type of multilateralism which is important and to my opinion also I think one has to be very open and well OECD countries have to be very open on the because now we have the SDGs you know we have to be open very open on the financial side because we have to be clear how many and the IMF has put that forward how much is needed either on the private side or on the public side in order to finance the SDGs if we want to be successful in this field. And actually, uh, you might think it's perhaps, uh, well, uh, a bit, well, irrational or, or visionary or whatever. I personally would think besides the SDGs, which are well, the software, the, the demands which we need, we need also some hardware, which is a control on the UN level in a kind of UN sustainable council without any uh, veto rights and so on. So you have to have some control in, in this field and also push the, uh, what, the meeting in, in July where everyone is meeting and telling wonder, wonderful things on the high level political forum is not the control we need in order to get the sustainable development goals uh, on board and, and ahead. Okay. You, know, you know, that's the General Assembly. The, it used to be that the General Assembly took far more initiatives and now all countries are coming as equals. And now it's all the Security Council, which is blocked and ineffective and full of vetoes. And we need the General Assembly, I think, to stand up and be much more assertive and demanding um, yeah. to get the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you talk about that Security Council, which has absolutely no African representation on it. Uh, which is which is quite appalling at this stage, given the, the, the demographics of the world. Um, but I do want to get nor into... Nor Asia, nor Asia either. <laughs> well, China as well as China, yeah. Um, I do, do want to get to us, uh, to the conversation um, about just, you know, we are in question and answer time, and we do have some questions that have come in, and I'm hoping that we can get through all of them. So I'm going to try and merge them, uh, some of them at least that I think go thematically. Um, somebody is asking here, and is rightly saying that, you know, what about the emphasis of having African countries creating their own wealth? Wesley is pointing out that there are a lot of resources uh, on this continent. Vera, I'm going to come to you on this one, and perhaps you can you can double that up with what Claire alluded to earlier in the conversation. She was talking about the Africa Free Trade Agreement um, and how we can use this moment to make the most of what the continent has done, really. And I think we, we haven't really quite caught the gravitas of what that means, what that could potentially do in terms of having the continent utilize the resources it has to create wealth because we are talking about a climate where there are warnings that foreign direct investment is not going to be coming in the way it, it has been in the past. Well, I am, I am down uh, for saying that the African continental free trade area is Africa's uh, plan for growth. And so we don't need any sort of big Marshall plans. That is our plan. And I think one of the things that is happening, and you have to give credit to uh, the leaders on the continent, President Ramaphosa, President Kagame, the President of Niger, President Yusufu, and many others, Kenya, Ghana, that have really come together and taken this as you know, the strategy for creating growth, creating wealth. We know, and the Economic Commission for Africa has done a lot of work that shows that when Africa trades with itself, Africa creates a lot more value. Now, what we need to do so that we can do that better is we need the enablers. I think as Hilda was the one that said it, we need more infrastructure, we need more energy, we need our roads, we need our ports to work. Uh, for that, we need more investment. We need the foreign direct investment, but a cheaper, uh, a cheaper cost, which is why we continue to talk about market access at much, much cheaper rates. We have the compact with Africa, for example, that is being launched, uh, that was launched uh, under the German chairmanship of the G20, the German 
uh, are going to take again over the EU. I think some of these kinds of partnerships are the partnerships now that Africa has the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement where you know, Germany is struggling with energy, the UK is. We come together with Africa. I think somebody talked about stranded assets. We have stranded assets, but we actually have no assets also in the energy sector. <laughs> Huge yeah. investment in the energy sector will you know, give us four or five percent additional in GDP growth. I think there is the secret for Africa's future development. We do have the technology, we have some of the resources, but we cannot do it alone. We need additional resources from right. other partners, but we need them at costs that do not run us into a debt crisis uh, much sooner than we would like. Okay, um, Heidi Marie, I'll throw this one to you because Vera has just spoken. It was also directed to Vera. Um, but Mandip was pointing out that um, the UN ECA has projected that by 2050, a quarter, get this, a quarter of the world's workforce will consist of African youth. Uh, so this is a demographic that, that we need to engage. So the question basically is, how can we then rethink our efforts so that we formalize the informal economy in Africa? And this is where a lot of these young people are, are active, um, so that it can contribute to the fis fiscal tax base of, of their countries, because we do have a lot going on in terms of entrepreneurial activity in the informal sector, because African youth can't access financing, for example, to, to grow beyond the informal sector. So what can we do um, to address this demographic specifically that the UN is projecting uh, will make up a quarter of the world's workforce by 2050? Well, uh, I think this would be a point where Vera could say much more than, than for instance, I could say on this. My point is, and has always been, I think it is important to strengthen women and their initiatives because, uh, I mean, no country gets ahead without strengthening women and, and also strengthening their rights. And also, by the way, in health questions, for instance, one must not forget that, for instance, uh, AIDS is still hitting women much more, young, young girls much more than, than men. So one has to strengthen women. This, I think, is a, a major point. And also perhaps what uh, I think could be the question of, uh, well, uh, forms of uh, professionalization mm. of uh, um, uh, the work of, of young people as uh, for instance in in different areas i think there would be quite a lot of possibilities but vera would be the person to can say i just honest. come in i mean the proportion of the economy with all the urbanization not just in capitals but smaller cities that's informal is massive and people are fantastically entrepreneurial particularly women i don't think i mean the question seems to imply that we should try to formalize all that I think that would be very bureaucratic and difficult, but I think more support needs to be given to enable those people to get the credit and to have marketplaces and you know to grow that part of the economy. Um, so I don't think we should be against informal, it's so massive. We should find better ways of supporting it and all that entrepreneurial energy, which is incredibly impressive. And that's all over the continent, especially in the informal settlements and the slums. Everybody's working away at something making some kind of a living, they need more support so that they can right. achieve more rather than trying to change them into different kind of workers, which those vacancies aren't there. Vera, you quickly do this one and then because I have a few more questions. So if you could do this one quickly, Vera, uh, on the same point and then I'll pose other questions to our panelists. Sorry, the, the, on, on, the formal, or on the formalization of the economies. I think, I think um, just, just one thing, essentially, no, we don't want to encourage formalization by, by sort of, you know, putting in, in position. Two things we need to do, and I continue to say that, is one, we need a, a digital economies, we need identities for everybody. Uh, in some ways, giving an identity to everybody gives then women access to finance, gives yeah. uh, kids, uh, I think there's just a comment on the fact that kids are now out of school. And one of the things that the COVID will do is increase inequality because those who have access to the internet will keep learning and those who don't have access to the internet will fall further behind. So one of the things that we're working together with UNICEF and others to do is to say, how can we close the education gap uh, in this crisis and not make it even worse off? And I think the benefit there is a lot of women in business. Nigeria has more women in business than any other country in the world. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you know, if we can educate them through the businesses that they're in, we begin to give them literacy education. 
because they have already missed, you know, the sort of basic secondary and, and primary education. But for those in basic uh, secondary and primary education, we need innovators out there to tell us and to teach us how we can deploy education on the COVID circumstances and ensure that the, you know, those who don't have access to digital technology uh, continue to catch up and we leave no one behind. Thanks very Evelyn. I actually want to come back on an earlier point. I couldn't get into that point, which is on the, um, the uh, free trade area and yeah. the continental free trade area. It is really important that the Europeans respond to that more positively. Mm -hmm. Because presently the European trade policy is fragmentizing the African market. You've got LDCs, you have the different economic groupings where they have economic partnership agreement with, which makes it very complicated. So I really think that one response should be from Europe, yes, we open our market for Africa. The way that in the Marshall Plan, the United States said to us Europeans, you can trade among yourself um, and you can export whatever you want to us, but we will, you know, we will not block anything from your side, but you can block stuff from us. You know, that kind of Marshall Plan would be great. The problem, by the way, 20 years ago was when all these issues were discussed on trade, that Africa didn't really talk out with one voice very loud. As opposed to in the big table that Hilda mentioned, where we had incredibly great African finance ministers who were loud and clear telling us where we should improve our behavior as donors. Now that one voice is really important in these African Union EU debates, not this foreign affairs diplomacy, uh, you know, politeness, but just say what the problem is in the face of the Europeans and what you think your actions should be. And that one voice, I think the lesson of Uchtein is, indeed, if you want to go far, go together. That's, you know, it's also in the book. Just work together. You can then exercise peer pressure way more effectively than as everybody does their own middle thing. So, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Hilda, I do want to bring you to the conversation now. You've been nodding there. Do you want to just weigh in on anything that's been asked? Because I can direct a specific question to you as well. You, you can, yeah, okay, again, one point and then I'm happy to take questions, no problem. So, so the only point I was thinking on the youth um, unemployment or the, the many youth in the informal sector um, is also that the education sector in secondary, um, at the secondary level needs reform in many countries. Much of it is very, very theoretical and isn't really enabling youth to create their own jobs after that with any particular uh, competence. Technical skills are needed for them to be able to create their own jobs and then credit is needed and matching the technical skills through much, much ex a significant expansion of technical schools so that people can be carpenters, the young guys can find different types of, of jobs that they can be skilled to do and with credit that will, I think, much improve the system. Today, too many schools, secondary schools, are basically, are basically theoretical, and they are expected to bring people to university, which is inaccessible to almost everyone. So a reform there is, is key. And I know um, the German um, GTZ has a yeah. huge program in this area, Vocational. which also my country has, uh, has uh, come in and co-funded. Yeah. Yeah. The vocational training, uh, yeah, a significant, uh, a significant initiative there is needed, and if you can combine that with credit made available to young people, it's uh, it's going to make a big difference. And to me also, it's not about being in the formal or informal; it's about creating your own job and being able to sustain a living. Okay, um, ladies, I wish I could continue, but we have reached the end of our session. Okay. There's never really enough time to do this, but thank you so much uh, for all of you for coming here. Thank you so much to our participants uh, who have been here today. Heide Marie uh, from Germany, thank you very much. Hilda from Norway, Evelyn from the Netherlands, Claire from the United Kingdom, because we are on a first name basis, and Verso, of course, uh, coming to us from that crucial office that you hold, and we are uh, really, really impressed with your efforts and all that you're doing to champion the message for the continent. I do want to give you the last word, Vera, before we say goodbye to everybody. So please, if you could do so in a minute. Now, I just want to say what an honor it has been to be with all of you and to learn from you. Uh, I, I say that you came too early, but maybe we can recreate the group of you and I will be <laughs> very happy to see how we do it and take this uh, woman power. I can learn a lot from you. 
But the continent needs uh, uh, our voices. The world needs our combined voices. And I think uh, maybe working together, we can do that at this crucial time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. And of Thank course, you. the Global Perspective yeah. Initiatives for bringing us all together. I call this reunion <laughs> since the spice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Conspiracy. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to all our Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.